I know that there have been many times in, in my life when I pray to God that the thing that I want more than anything else is just mercy. That I know that I've struggled. I know that I fall. I know that it's something that I've tried to deal with before. And here it is once again creeping up. And when I bow my head to my God, I don't have any excuses. I don't have any reasons for the things that have happened except for God, I, I need your mercy. That's where David was when he wrote this particular psalm. David, as you probably have a footnote in your Bibles, wrote this particular psalm when he had committed the sin with Bathsheba. Pretty much all of us remember the story very well, that David's armies were out making war. David was not, as God commanded the kings to do, he was not out there with his soldiers. Instead, he was back at the palace. And he's walking around and he sees this woman bathing on the roof. And instead of looking away or going back inside, he has her brought to him. And this woman, Bathsheba, who's a married woman, he takes her, lies with her. She becomes pregnant with a child. He sends her back home, but he finds out that she is with child. And so to try to cover this up, he says, well, I'm going to have her husband killed. Then I can take her as one of my wives and everything will be fine. But Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, is such an honorable man, he doesn't go back out, he doesn't go home to his wife. He stays there with the king, and the king tries to get him drunk so that he'll go home and spend time with his wife, and so maybe this, it looked like he got her pregnant. Wouldn't happen. And so he is made to be put out into the front line in the, in the heat of the battle, then people withdraw back, and he's killed in that battle. And David now takes Bathsheba as his own. We can't hide things from God, though. And no matter how much covering up was going on and how much David tried to make this sin go away and to not deal with it directly, what he had done, God still knew it. And so Nathan the prophet comes to David and he tells David the story about the man who has this one little lamb that was almost like a child to him. And this other man who had lots of lambs has somebody come to see him. And instead of taking one of his own to, to feed his guest, he takes this one man's lamb and slaughters it just so that he could have it for his own feast. And David says, the man who would do such a thing as that is deserving of death. And that's when Nathan makes that very uh, famous statement. You're the man. And so David is confronted with his sin. And it's in response to that that David writes this particular psalm. And it's very fitting that the first two words out of David's mouth in this psalm is have mercy. Mercy. David had no excuses for what he had done. And David was deserving of death because of what he had done. And David thought he could hide from all the things that he had done. But when he goes to God, he goes with something that all of us go to all the time. Asking God for mercy. The problem is, is that there's been several people in the Bible that we can talk about. We're going to talk briefly about Paul tonight. And how he was someone that he was responsible for, for dragging Christians out of their houses and consenting to their death. We can think about Peter and how it was that he had made this great bold statement that he was willing to go to death with Jesus Christ. And then when he is just simply accused of knowing the man, Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about, and denies him three times. Over and over again, we see that we, we have great expectations of ourselves when everything is peaceful, but then we fall short in the moment of battle. And then when we do that, it's easy for us to feel disappointed because the Bible tells us in Romans 3, 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're told in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 that the Lord's hand is not short and His ears not heavy, that He can't reach or that He can't hear, but it's because of our iniquities that we've separated ourselves from God. We know that Romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Romans 1 tells us that if we do these things that are in that, that avalanche of sin that the uh, people the, among the Gentiles especially had committed, that they're deserving of death. And if we consent with those that do those things, we're deserving of death. Hebrews 10 tells us that if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, deserving of death. And so it is very difficult to sometimes come to grips with the fact that when I go to God and I say, God, please have mercy, that God actually has mercy. And even though intellectually I can read the Bible and see that God says that I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to forgive you so outstandingly, so dramatically, that I'm going to take your sins and throw them into the midst of the sea to where no one can find them, ever. Even though intellectually I know that, it's difficult because I live with guilt. And guilt can hold me prisoner. And so Satan is able to take something that is as beautiful 
as songs that we just sang a moment ago, Jesus having healing in his wings and use that against us. That we can have someone who, who says to all of us, I need your prayers and I need your support because in the sight of God, I have fallen short. I've done those things that I know I should not do and I'm deserving, rightly so, of God's condemnation. And Satan can take something like that and hold it over their head for the rest of their life as a Christian and keep them from fulfilling the things that God would have them to do. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is that idea of, of having that freedom of, that comes along with forgiveness. One of the things that we have to do if we do want this freedom uh, that comes with forgiveness is that first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that our complete dependence has to be upon God and His mercy. There was nothing that David could do to make up for what had happened. And David, it seems, had come, become very self-sufficient and that he was going to work out this problem and work out this situation. That he was going to have Uriah the Hittite come in and, and lie with his wife. When that didn't work, well, we'll kill Uriah off and then I'll bring her to my house. And he started formulating all these plots and all these schemes to try to work out this problem that he had created in his life. But the one thing that he should have done is the one thing that he was finally driven to do. And that is to be totally dependent on God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's grace. Let's read verses 1 through 3 once again. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God. And notice that's according to God's loving kindness. It's according to the multitude of God's mercies. It is God who is the one who can blot out transgressions. It is God who is the one who washes thoroughly from iniquity. It is God who cleanses from sin. But this is the point. David had to acknowledge his transgressions and make his sin plain before God. And so we have to also take responsibility for our actions. It's amazing to me that David, as he was hearing the thing about this man who had this lamb that uh, was slaughtered so that another man could feed his guest, and that David became so outraged by that that this man ought to die for what he did, and David not make the connection to what he himself had done. But we have all been there where we can see the sins that other people have committed and we can see the things that's going on in their lives and we can see how they have messed things up and we can see how they transgress and we can see how God would be angry with them about what they have done. But when it comes to us, we think somehow it's different because after all, we had reasons for it. But if we're going to enjoy the freedom that comes with forgiveness, we have to be very willing, very anxious and very humble when we go to God and just say to God, God, I have sinned against you. I don't know why it is that we'll sometimes, I'm sure I'm not the only one, that we will sometimes go to God and ask God to forgive us in a very generic way for our sins as if he does not know specifically what those sins are. Why is it in my own personal prayers I don't say to God, God, you know how angry I got. And you know the things I was thinking at that particular moment. God, you know that I did not with my tongue say the things that I wanted to say, but in my head they were running a thousand miles per hour, per hour. God, you know what's going on. You know what I struggle with. You know where I failed. And here are my failures. I acknowledge my transgressions before you. I have to be totally dependent on God's mercy because I cannot work that out on my own. I need mercy. I need forgiveness. But it comes first and foremost through acknowledging it and saying, God, I was wrong. You also see in this particular psalm in verses 7 through 17, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out, <clears throat> blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then, you might want to underline that word then because that's the transition in this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways 
and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the, the, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not dispose, uh, despise sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And a broken and contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. One of the things that you see is that we have to truly repent and plead to God for forgiveness. Then these things happen. God, restore to me happiness. Restore to me joy. Restore to me singing. Restore to me peace. Restore to me contentment. Restore to me. Because all of those things have been lost. That's what guilt does to you. And living with guilt and refusing to repent and refusing to change your ways and refusing to acknowledge leads only to disaster. David describes it as his bones being broken. And indeed, when you know that you have sinned against God, it feels like you have just been broken in two. There is a huge weight that has come crashing down upon you that you cannot lift, you cannot move, you cannot deal with, and as much as you struggle and as much as you try, there is nothing you can do. You just keep digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into a pit. But David says, Lord, restore to me these things. We plead to our God. The great and wonderful thing about that is our God is anxious to hear. And our Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 7, it says that he always lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews tells us that he is like a, a, a sympathizing high priest and he knows all the struggles that we are going through. It tells us that he was tempted in every way such as we are, yet he was without sin. And therefore, he can approach God as his perfect sacrifice that he can make intercession for us when we go to God and speak on our behalf because he loves us that much. And so when I plead to my God, he is not someone, as David points out here, he is not someone who says, okay, I'll forgive you, but I want you to go out here and do all these different sacrifices. I want you to go get a thousand rams. I want you to give your firstborn. I want you to do all these other things to appease me. David says, if that's what you wanted, that's what I would have done. But the thing that you wanted from me was a broken and contrite spirit. And that's what I'm giving to you, my God. When you have messed up, when you have sinned, when you've transgressed and going to, going, gone against your God, you need to feel broken. And it needs to humble you. And with everything that is in me, I need to pray to my God and say, God, I know there's nothing I can do. The sacrifices that you require have already been made, except for one. I have been proud and I have been arrogant and that's why I sinned against you. I was self-sufficient and I did not think I needed you anymore. The world offered me something that I thought was better than anything that you had and I was wrong. And look at the mess that I've made. Forgive me. Have mercy. Teach my lips to sing again. Make my prayers sweet again. Make my devotion and my worship worthy again restore to me just the joy that comes with salvation because that's what we need more than anything else and that's what David had lost when he had committed that sin in Ezekiel chapter 18 Ezekiel 18 is starting at verse 21 It says, if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. God says this, do I have any pleasure at all? At all. Do I have any pleasure at all? In other words, there's not even one ounce of pleasure. There's not one instance of pleasure that God has that the wicked should die and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Every evil person you've read about in the scriptures and every evil person that has come upon the scene in the, in the history of mankind, there was never pleasure and there was never any pleasure in God that that wicked person should die, but that every one of them should turn from his ways and live. 
But when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way which is fair and not in your ways which are not fair. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, preserves himself alive. Because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? God says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord. And here's the point. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? God is pleading and he is begging them because God knows that he must judge. And so he is begging and pleading, why should you die? You're ruining your life now and you're going to die in the end. Why? God says, turn from your wickedness and you will live. It's a simple process. And that's what David was calling for in his own life. When that happens, we should also bear fruits that are worthy of repentance. David was a man that was a man after God's own heart. And though he had messed up, David still, though he had sinned grievously, David is still a person that we look to so often for encouragement and strength. And he's not alone in that. Luke, Luke 19 and verse 8. There's this little man named Zacchaeus. And he stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And this is just one tiny little example in the scriptures of those that we come upon that they know that in the sight of God they are wrong and they are ready to be released from that burden of guilt. And Zacchaeus was such a man who said that if I know that I have done something wrong, I seek to restore as much as I possibly can. Even above what is required, I restore. And the reason being is because I don't want to wrong anyone. That's what God wants of all of us. Ephesians chapter 2, which is a beautiful chapter that talks about grace and how it is that we're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, and starting at verse 1, Paul enumerates all the grievousness that had existed among them in their former lives. And he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, again he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. And we stop right there too often and say, look, it's by the grace of God that we are saved. And we all say amen. And there's no other way by which we can be saved except by the grace of God. And there's too many in the world who say, and that's it. And so since it's according to grace, there's nothing else that God wants. And verse 10 says what? That we were made alive. We were created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Bearing fruit worthy of repentance. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And we know his former lifestyle. We know who Peter was, but by the grace of God, we know who he became. We know how David had fallen and sinned with Bathsheba, but by the grace of God, we know that he was a man after God's own heart. 
And over and over and over again, we see it in the scriptures. And over and over and over again, we come through these doors in the back and we look one another in the eye. And I know what kind of person you were and you know what kind of person I was. But by the grace of God, we are what we are. Amen? By grace, you've been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves because you have nothing to boast of. But because of that, now you can bear fruits that are worthy of repentance. Not because God is saying you must bear fruits worthy of repentance or else, but because now you're actually qualified to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And by the grace of God, let's bear fruits that are worthy of that repentance. God has forgiven me of my sins. What can I do? I, I can't repay anything. But let me sing. Let me serve. Let me be there. Let me lead. Let me follow, whatever it may be. God, what do you want me to do? You saved me from the world, and you placed me in your kingdom, and I have fallen short and sinned against you, and I went into your presence and acknowledged that and begged you for mercy, and you forgave me. Glory be to God. And by grace, you have been saved. So let us now bear fruits worthy of that. That's one of those things that releases that burden of guilt that is there, not because you're continually paying some type of penance for the things you've done. You will never be able to repay it. But the thing about it is, that debt doesn't exist anymore because it was canceled. God forgave it. That debt no longer exists. And so you're not paying off a debt. You're living for righteousness. And so let go of that guilt and move on in your life and have that freedom that comes with God saying your sins are forgiven. And accept it. 1 John 3. This was mentioned not too long ago. 1 <clears throat> John 3 and verse 20. When we have such guilt going on in our lives. And our heart condemns us. It's comforting to know verses like this. It says that if our heart condemns us. God is greater than our heart. And God knows all things. Romans 8.1 I know is, is a popular verse among many here. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's comforting because we are to know that God loves me, God forgives me, and God has given to me redemption. In John chapter 21, you think about how difficult it must have been for Peter to remember that he had sat there with Jesus, that he had ate with Jesus, that he had been with Jesus. He had rebuked Jesus for talking about dying. And Peter says, it will not be so. I will stand up and I will fight and I will go to death for you and with you. This is not going to happen. Peter made his stand and he made a statement to that effect. And then when push came to shove, Peter did the same thing that David did. And Peter did the same thing that all of us do so often. We fold. Because it didn't come off quite the way that we expected and Satan threw at us something that we didn't foresee. And it was really easy to make such a bold statement in the company of a lot of people who agree with me. But now when it's just me and these people around this fire, Peter's not so confident anymore. And he denies the Lord three times. And yet when Jesus comes to them as they're out there fishing, and Peter realizes that it's Jesus, as Peter typically does, he jumps in the water, starts swimming to the shoreline. It's the Lord, he says. And he gets there to the shoreline, and now it's like, Oh, wait a minute. I had denied him. And now I'm face to face with him. But you see the acceptance of our Lord? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Essentially, we, we look at the, the statements that Peter makes, and I've done this often as well to, to, to make a point of it, that, you know, Peter has that conversation with Jesus, and three times he's asked if he, if he loves him. Peter three times says that he does. And then at the end, Jesus tells them that when you're older, someone's going to take you to a place you don't want to go. They're going to gird you, and, and you're going to die. And Peter says, looks at John, well, what about this man? And we point out the fact that, that Peter does that. But one thing I think sometimes we miss, I know I've missed it a lot. Peter failed the Lord. But you see in this that Jesus still believes in Peter. Because he tells Peter... Next time, you're going to do better. Because next time, you actually will go to death. You denied me the first time. Peter, I want you to feed my sheep, tend my lambs. And in the end, you're going to do better than you did before. You actually are going to die. And it's going to be for me. 
that's the Lord's acceptance. And that's how much the Lord forgives when he forgives you. You beg God for mercy and for tenderness and loving kindness. God says, not only do I forgive you, but I know you can do better next time. Because Satan isn't done with you. And he's going to present the same temptation again to try to get you to fall again to the same temptations that you've fallen to in the past. But you can do better. So accept the Lord's forgiveness so that you can become stronger in the future than you were in the past. In 1 Timothy 1, in verse 13, it's so telling when you hear Paul say words such as this, that he was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But then he says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He talks about in that passage as well that the Lord came to save sinners, of whom he says in verse 15, he is the chief of all these sinners. We know how it was that, that Paul struggled it seems, with the sins that he had, had committed in his life. And yet that same Paul is, is able to say in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. It is very inspiring to hear Paul say those types of things after knowing the kind of person that he was. But you see, Paul was able, in spite of all that he had done against the Lord, personally against the Lord, in spite of all that, Paul was still able to say with confidence, there is laid up for me. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what I've done. When the Lord forgives, it is forgiven. And we're supposed to be able to say with confidence, there is laid up for me. I'm not going to let Satan make me feel so guilty about all that I've done, and it was horrible. I know what it was like. I know what it's like to feel like the chiefest of sinners. I know how bad it was. But there is laid up for me. Because remember what we said earlier? It's about God's mercy. You can't work it out on your own. It's about his mercy. It's about his forgiveness. With that being said, we also have to realize, though, that we do have to accept the consequences of what we have done. In 2 Samuel 12, you remember that after Nathan tells David that he's the man. He is then also told that the sword will not leave his house. He's told that the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with is going to die. And David had to accept those consequences. And those consequences haunted David the rest of his life. It divided the kingdom in, in future generations. It was something that divided his household and had his own family members murdering one another. It, had his own, it resulted in his own son being killed because he's trying to usurp the, thr the throne from his father. David had to live with the consequences. Paul had to live with the consequences. Peter had to live with the consequences. Brethren, we have to live with the consequences of the sins that we have committed. There are some things that you have done that there's nothing else in this life that can happen to erase that. And in this life, you will have to suffer the consequences of the choices that you made. But life is so short. And there's nothing that you will suffer through in this life that's worthy to be compared with the glory yet to be revealed. You will spend eternity with the Lord. And that should be comfort to us. Don't let the circumstances, don't let the consequences drag you down so much that you don't think you can be of value to our God. Because Peter was, Paul was, David was, Abraham was, Moses was, every person who has ever sinned, when they've been forgiven, they're of value in the Lord's work even though the consequences are there it breaks our heart to read about Moses and how it was that he messed up with a rock speaking to it or, or striking it what difference does it really make the difference was God had told him what to do he disobeyed and the consequence was all these many years decades waiting to go into the promised land and because of this silly rock he's not able to go into the promised land consequences yes that's exactly right and it was a righteous thing for God to deny him that and I tell you what I believe I'm going to see Moses in heaven I don't think that rock means a whole lot to him now because he's with God just as we all hope for 
So we should accept the Lord's forgiveness, even when we have to accept the consequences that come with it. Paul's life was going to be dedicated to the preaching of the gospel. And because of that, notice some of the things that he was going to have to go through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and starting at verse 23, Paul says, Are they not ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, and in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirsting, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, he says in verse 28, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul had consequences for living righteously. How much more so when we choose to live unrighteously? And so, when we enjoy all of these things, when we embrace all of these things, that helps us to release that burden of guilt and feel what it means to truly have that load off of us and to be forgiven. But one last thing we have to also do is we have to also forgive others. Unfortunately, one of the things that will often happen is that we realize the, the great debt that Christ paid on our behalf so that our sins be forgiven. And then we see someone else who sins against us and it seems that that thing that they do against us is much worse, in our opinion, is much worse than what we've done against God. And because of that, we decide, I'm not going to forgive you. And I'm going to hold a grudge against you because of what you've done. And I forget what it is that God forgave me for. What God forgave cost him the life of his son. What this person did to me may have bruised my ego a little bit. It may have taken something from me that was going to perish in this world anyway. And because of that, I won't forgive. And that's exactly what Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 18. When the question is asked, how many times should I forgive my brother? How many times do I have to do that? Is there a, is there a number to that? Do I just forgive them completely? And so Jesus tells the story of these two servants who owed a great debt. Peter says, how often shall my brother sin against me? In verse 21, and I forgive him. Up to seven times? Jesus says, I don't say up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle them, there was one in verse 24 who owed him 10,000 talents, something he could not have even repaid in a lifetime. He wasn't able to pay in verse 25, so his master said that he should be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. And that servant did the same thing that David did in Psalm 51. He said, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Have mercy on me is what he's asking for. The master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. Sound familiar? <laughs> but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hold his hands on him and took him by the throat. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down on his feet. And begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Sound familiar? It's the same words that he had just used himself. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay that debt. And you see what happens. That king finds out about it. And that king comes back, and he takes vengeance. I forgave you of that huge debt that you owed the king. And you wouldn't forgive your fellow servant? One of the best things you can do to feel the burden of forgiveness lifted away from you is by forgiving someone else. There's probably several of us in this audience tonight that we have something against someone that we've been harboring, that we've been holding on to, and maybe even been waiting for that moment by which we can grab them by the neck and say, pay me what you owe. You need to forgive. It's one of the best ways to have that burden released off your own shoulders. Forgive. Have the heart, have the spirit of forgiveness. Remember that you yourself went to God and said, God, have mercy for me, for what I have done. And God says, I will. Now you have mercy for someone else. Because that makes you more like me. And that's what God desires. 
I hope this is something that's been encouraging to you. I've been studying on this real hard this week, and it's been something that has really been going through my mind a lot. And I think it is a great lesson for us because it, it's hard when you know what God says about sin and how devastating sin is. And you ask the question, can God really forgive me? Yes is the answer. There's no hesitation in saying yes. There's no restrictions in saying yes, God can forgive. And so if you want forgiveness, it is available to you. And so that's the question I'm going to ask you is, have you been forgiven? If you haven't had your sins washed away because you haven't obeyed the gospel and been baptized for the remission of your sins, you have that occasion to do so tonight. If you need to confess sin and turn your back on the world that you might be reunited back in fellowship with God, just say to God, God have mercy as David asked for it. God will restore the joy of your salvation. Let us help you if we can. As together we stand and sing, won't you please come?